we're fortunate as we practice that we've got a lot of good guidance. We've got the Buddhist teachings, the teachings of noble disciples, the great Johns. But even so, as we sit down and meditate, for each of us it's a process of discovery. Sort of the way Columbus discovered America. It wasn't really lost. A lot of other people knew that America was there. But he didn't know. And so when he came across it, for him it was a discovery. And it's the same for us as we sit down and meditate. In one way we're going over territory that the other people have gone over many, many times before. But for us it's new. And in that sense we have to learn how to be our own teachers, our own guides. We have to learn how to be our own mainstay. As the Buddha said, the Self is its own mainstay. And so a lot of the practice is learning how to be a reliable mainstay for yourself. So when something happens in your meditation, you have a sense of how reliable it is, which means that you have to become reliable. In this area, it's good to learn from people who have to do a lot of exploring on their own, people like Ajahn Mun or Basika Gi. They received training as they started out, but then they found there were a lot of areas they had to explore on their own. In John Munn's case, he had a lot of psychic knowledge, which his teacher, John Sao, didn't have. And John Sao told him that he was going to have to learn how to find his way through that and not get thrown off course. There are two lessons that he relied on. One I learned from John Fuang, which was that whatever comes up in your meditation in terms of a vision, you don't try to figure out whether, say, you know, someone comes and, and speaks to you, is this a real deva or whatever. The question is, is it a good Dharma lesson? That's always the, what you should be looking for. What kind of Dharma lesson do you gain from this? It doesn't matter who tells you, and this, re this applies to books as well. A particular Dharma lesson may be good for somebody at some time, but it's not necessarily good for you right now. So you have to learn how to judge when insight comes into your mind. The first question is, what kind of impact does it have? What, if you took that insight for being true, what would it do to your actions? This comes under the principle of appropriate attention, figuring out, is this going to help you understand suffering? Is it going to help you abandon craving? Does it, will it help you develop the path? Those are the questions you want to ask. And John Lee had a student a woman who had worked in the palace for many years, and she had listened to many, many of the great sermon givers in Bangkok in her time. Then she was told by one of her teachers to go to listen to John Lee, and at first she thought, what does he know? He's been living all of his life out in the woods. And here I've been in Bangkok and listened to all the great sermon givers. But she went and listened anyhow. And she found she learned a lot of things she'd never learned before. He taught her how to meditate, and she turned out to be psychic in a lot of ways. And one time in, in one of her meditation sessions, she had this vision. And then a voice appeared in the vision and said, This is when you were living in Jaitawana. And she came out of meditation and thought, well, Jaitawana, I know that name. I've heard it before, but what is it? It took her three days to remember that Jetavana was the monastery where the Buddha had lived.
but instead of getting excited that she had a memory of a previous lifetime and may have been someone living in Chaitamana, she was she took the lesson here. It's a real lesson in how unreliable your memory is. She had been ch chanting suttas that had taken place in Chaitamana most of her life, and yet she had forgotten. So instead of coming to a conclusion as to whether the vision was true, she took it as a Dharma lesson. See how inconstant your perceptions are. That's making good use of a vision. As for insights that come, the John Fung often used to say, don't try to memorize them. You're not here to write a book. If an insight comes, try to apply it right now. And see what impact it has. And if it's not relevant to what's happening right now, he says, just forget it. It'll come back when you need it. If you if it's an insight that's actually going to be useful. But the insight is to be measured by its immediate impact. What it does. Wisdom, after all, is strategic. So how would you take that insight and use it as a strategy? John Munn had another piece of advice, which you can read about it in John Mahabua's account of John Munn's passing away. He was feeling really abandoned. And then he remembered a piece of advice he'd gotten many times from John Munn. He says, when something comes up in your meditation that you're not sure about it, just watch it. Stay with a sense of the knower, or just bare awareness. Don't jump to any conclusions. Just watch to see where it goes. And that way you come out safe. Again, it's a lesson in not jumping to conclusions. As for Bhaskagi, one of her favorite pieces of advice was that, remember, there are many layers in your mind. Just because you're getting an insight on one layer doesn't mean everything is done. You have to watch for what happens next. In other words, when you let go of something, what comes up in its place? Is there any pride? We'll see if you can let go of that. If you let any pride or conceit build up around an attainment or an insight, then you've blinded yourself. As soon as something comes up and seems important, watch what happens next in the mind. You notice that all these pieces of advice teach you to be very careful about causality and learning to see things simply in a causal process. What happens after the insight? What can the insight be used for? If you're not sure if it's reliable, step back. Don't get involved. Keep watching, watching, watching. And we're not here just to be watching and being in the present moment because it's a great place to be, because it's one of the best places to watch things as they unfold. Before you slap labels on them like this is me or this is mine or this is somebody else's. Before you start conjuring up all the processes of becoming around them. Learning to th see things as events, as they come, as they go. Particularly so that you can see where you're adding an un any unnecessary suffering, what your intentions are doing, what your attention is doing, how you pay attention to things. Is that helping to alleviate suffering, or is it going to add any more on? So it's not like we're just accepting things. We actually have to pass judgment. And you need some guidance in how to pass judgment. This is one of the reasons why we develop mindfulness and concentration. We're trying to develop that mind that the Buddha said is like earth or like fire. That doesn't shrink back from disgusting things and doesn't get excited about pleasant things. One that's willing to watch 
you have that sense of patience. It allows you to see things all the way from cause to effect. And then after the effect, what's the effect after that? And what's the effect after that? Keep watching. So you can start seeing through all the many layers in the mind. Because we're not here just to get into the present moment. We're here to dig down into the present moment. And the Buddha's teachings on karma contain a riddle. Our experiences depend to some extent on the past, but also we have this ability to choose in the present moment. We have a certain amount of freedom. What is that freedom? Why is it there? How can we make the most use of it? That's where you want to look, so you can peel away the various layers and go through the present moment into something that really is deathless. When the Buddha talked about the deathless, he wasn't talking just in metaphorical terms. There's a dimension that doesn't die. Anything that's in space and time is going to die at some point. Even stars die. We're not talking about movie stars, we're talking about stars up in the sky. <laughs> Galaxies get sucked into black holes, and who knows what happens to black holes. But there is a dimension that's something you can touch in the mind. It's not subject to all that change. And it's not in the present, in the sense of being in time. Sometimes people talk as if the present was somehow out of time. The present is a very important part of time. When you dig down in the present, you find something that's outside of that dimension. So you have to remember that your insights are tools for that. We're not here to gather up insights that we can take home and put in a scrapbook. Wisdom is not the aim of the practice. Wisdom is one of the tools. And a large part of that wisdom is learning how to use your tools properly. Learn how to make yourself a reliable mainstay, so you can judge when something happens whether it's useful or not. And keep these lessons in mind so that whatever comes up doesn't pull you off the path. You learn how to govern your own practice. Evaluate your own discoveries. Because when you come right down to it, even if you had the Buddha sitting here in front of you telling you what to do, you would still have to decide whether it was reliable or not. You'd have to figure out what he was saying, how it applied. So despite all the help we get, we have to keep coming back to ourselves. It's one of the reasons why the Buddha said, let someone who is observant and honest, who is no deceiver, come. And he said, I will teach that person the Dharma. Basically, when he says that, he's telling you to look in yourself for what you're going to need in order to learn the Dharma. You have to be observant and you have to be no deceiver. You have to be honest with yourself. And so the Buddha gives you lessons on how to do that, but then you're the one who has to apply them. You're the one who has to judge the results. Did you apply them well? You have a teacher living nearby, the teacher can help looking from the outside, noticing if there are some obvious blind spots. But even then, you have to be the responsible one. And the good news is that you can. Just learn how to do it well.